my goodness, goodness, guys. Yeah, sit down if you can. That is just such an awesome word. That is, isn't it, brother? That is really a great one. Um, it's just amazing to me how uh, our praise team is just so on top of things with these, with the with the anthems and with the praise and the worship and the newness and freshness, and they just choose really good stuff. I think uh, the Lord leads them that way, and I know <clears throat> I say every time I like everything they do, so I'm not <laughs> I'm not really much of a critic here. But uh, man, that was good, all of it, guys. Just as good to hear your voice back again and your guitar and. All of them add so much, and Joseph, I guarantee you, have been so faithful, all of them through the, through the years, just a wonderful group. You know, I don't know how churches manage when they, their praise teams aren't really consistent and when they don't have people that uh, they can count on and so forth. And I know for most churches, uh, praise teams are volunteers, uh, just like choirs and other forms of uh, leading the worship and so forth. And God uses all of it. And it's a, it's a wonderful gift to be able to have. And it, it really encourages my heart. And usually I sing way too loud and way too hard, and, uh, <laughs> and I wear myself out. But anyway, uh, we praise the Lord for that. We're in a series called Change Your Life, and have been for the last couple of weeks. And uh, the attempt here is to take uh, five areas of life, uh, and I, basically I chose five areas arbitrarily, really, to just focus in on and, and, and say, all right, what does the Scripture have to say about these major areas of life. I mean, these are not areas that are uh, obscure or have very little to do with the kind of person we are. These are the areas that determine what we reflect as our character and our values. These are the things that if we do them, they will change our lives. I mean, these are not just isolated little things that uh, are cute to look at and so forth. These are the major issues of life and what the scripture has to say about these. And I've taken 10 in each of the categories to try to really synthesize and to uh, make the points of um, if, if you're a person that wants to be a better person and you want the scripture to say something relevant to you so that when you come to church, you hear something that matters when you live out your life the next week and for the rest of your life. Then this series is really designed to, to, to be that for you. Uh, I've been pastoring almost 50 years. Uh, I've been in uh, eight churches over those 50 years, small churches, large churches, country churches, city churches, um, all types of natures uh, of the churches and, va and, and, and purposes and so forth. But uh, out of all that time, if you said, all right, pastor, what kind of person do you admire? Uh, what kind of person when you see these things that you say, that's what we need to be. Uh, what are those things, those important issues? And so I've done that with the mind, uh, with 10 laws of the mind, because the mind is a terrible thing to waste. Everything begins with your mind. If anything's gonna change in your life, it's gonna start in your mind. And then your mouth, what you say, uh, how you conduct yourself. Uh, the things that come out of you, uh, the things that reflect your heart, those things that the mouth, the Bible has a lot to say about the, about the mouth. Uh, James exclusively has many, has several chapters about basically your tongue and, and the use and the, and the warnings and so forth of all of that. So we all know that if we have somebody we like to be around, it can't be somebody that can't control what they say. Uh, nobody feels comfortable with that. Everybody's anxious, and it really uh, has a lot of impact and influence over uh, the kind of people we are and the kind of people we like to be around and be with and the people we want to be in life. Now, today, um, I'm going to enter one that might sound a little bit sterile. If, if, uh, if any of these would sound a little bit sterile, when I say that we're going to look at finances today, um, you know, you, you probably in your mind can say, oh, 
finances, man, how in the world could finances be one of the major areas of life that has to do with the kind of person we are or become? And I know as I begin to name these laws for you, you'll begin to see that, um, that, that, that the management of our finances is, is an issue of leadership that, um, that just can't be swept under the table as being insignificant in life. I mean, if you can't be dependable and, 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 and you, can't, uh, you can't be honest in your finances, then how could we trust you to be honest and dependable about anything else in life? I mean, finances are only one of many areas that reflect the closeness of your relationship with God, but it is one of the areas that reflects your relationship with God. And if your financial life was called to the witness stand to give a testimony for your life in eternity, what kind of testimony would your financial life give you? Would it give you the testimony that you are very close to God and that he is the king of your life, or would it testify that you have a very shallow relationship with God and there are very few things that matter to you in the area of character and integrity? Because what happens in our financial life, the scripture has just so many tremendous things to say about it. And it is one of the major issues of all of our life. I don't know anyone that doesn't have issues with finances somehow in their life. And as a matter of fact, in family life, uh, because I've done a lot of counseling with marriage counseling and so forth, in family life, uh, the issue of finances is indicated in, in at least 50% of the divorces that happen in this country. The finances are listed as one of the contributing factors to the destruction of that relationship. So, Finances are very vital. All right, so here are the 10 laws of finances. This is what the Bible says is important about us and our finances. Number one, the law of contentment. The law of contentment. Basically, the law of contentment says that we need to learn how to be satisfied with things in life because if our life is filled with the constant pursuit of something more, our lives are never gonna be happy because they'll always be searching for something more in life. Let me read a passage. This is Luke 12, and, and, and it's several verses, but I'm just gonna read through them and, and uh, try to move quickly through these verses. Uh, Luke 12, verse 22, this is um, Jesus talking to his disciples about the issues of their life, that, what they have, and so forth. Verse 22, then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, what you'll put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, which, uh, uh, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least... Why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will, you, will he clothe you O oh, you of little faith. And don't seek what you shall eat and what you shall drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. And so God says, verse 18, so Jesus said to them, why do you call me good? No one, excuse me, let me, let me get on the right one. Here it is. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. 
Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. And here's a, a famous verse line at the end. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus is telling us that it is not his plan for us to live a life full of stress about finances. And that stress and anxiety is, an, is one of the number one factors today with finances being the number one cause for stress in life. And, and, and that stress-free living, which God intends for us to live in the area of our finances and our resources in life, begins with priorities that life is more than the accumulation of, of stuff. Because the question is, how much is enough? Uh, we have an entire industry nowadays that has one purpose in life, and that is to convince us that whatever we have is not enough. It's called the advertising industry. And the advertising industry's job is to, is to convince you that your life can't be complete and you can't really be happy unless you have this particular product that they're putting before us. I mean, it slices, it dices, it does. But wait, there's more, 1995. And then that genius marketing ploy, uh, get, a, get a second one for an extra fee, <laughs> for an extra fee. I mean, that was just marketing genius, but... But their intent is to create discontent in you about what your life has so that you will then be encouraged to seek after more. But Jesus is saying here, look, this will transform your life. If you realize that if you'll seek the kingdom of God first, that it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God's intent is to provide for us to take care of our lives. If we seek him first, he's going to give us the kingdom. Uh, invest in things beyond yourself and your heart follows your investment. Wherever your investment is, that's where your heart is going to be. So contentment is an inside job. You'll never have enough to make you happy. One of the billionaires of the world that was a billionaire when I was growing up, and he, he, right before he passed away, Howard Hughes was asked, Howard, uh, how much money is enough money? And Howard Hughes, who was a billionaire and had everything in the world that he desired, his answer was just a little bit more. So if we can't be content in life, then our life is never going to be stress-free, anxiety-free. We have to prioritize the values that we have in life. And contentment is one of those things that will uh, bless us and save us from lots of stress and anxiety. Law number two, the law of the budget. Now, I know I just felt the stress level go up when I even said the word. Um, I know the mention of the word budget can take all the air out of the room. Because many people, when they hear the word budget, they're thinking, all right, he's going to try to convince me that I need a budget and I don't want to, you know, I don't want a budget. Well, let me just put it to you this way about a budget. Um, do you have a gas gauge on your automobile? Well, yeah. All right, does it work? Have you ever been in a vehicle where the gas gauge doesn't work? Do you, did you ever feel comfortable while you were driving that vehicle where the gas gauge doesn't work? Probably not. And the reason why is because you didn't know how much fuel you had in your vehicle and you don't like walking. Well, a budget is simply a tool for you to use in your financial life like a gas gauge is in an automobile. I mean, I, I, when I see my gas gauge in my automobile on full, then it helps me to relax 
and to know that my vehicle is, is full of fuel and I can feel comfortable about the fact that I'm not going to be walking a few minutes from now. So that's all a, that's all a budget is. You get a paycheck, you put your check, paycheck in the bank, your account goes to full. <laughs> I mean, theoretically, your account goes to full, but you can't go out and, and paint the town red and, and uh, spend every dime that you have in your bank account. Uh, and then halfway through the week, you find out you don't have any more resources, so you end up walking. So how do you fix that problem so that that doesn't happen to you? Well, here's what Jesus said in Luke 14, verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down and first count the cost whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he's laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and he was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Well, the budget is an instrument for answering those kinds of questions in our financial life. Because a budget reflects our priorities. So what should the budget reflect? What should be the priorities of our life? Well, my suggestion is, obviously, that I'm gonna put God first. That when, my che when I get my check, the first thing I'm going to consider is, I owe God a tithe. And I know there are lots of discussions about tithing and people have all kinds of ideas about tithing. But God says that he needs to be first in our life. And that if we will give him first, then he will bless the remainder. The second area, and we all know we have to do this because if we don't, we're gonna end up in tremendous issues and trouble and maybe even jail. We've got to take care of the government. Now, most of our taxes come out before we even get our checks. Usually, Social Security income taxes come out, and we don't even really see them. We just see a line on the ledger. And I'm, I, I venture to say, now, listen, I've, uh, I'm, self, I'm considered self-employed by the government, by the way. Uh, the government considers me a private contractor that sells my services to the church. So that means every quarter I have to pay my own taxes, and I have to estimate how much I'm going to owe. Uh, and I'm going to tell you this, if everybody had to do that, if everybody got the money, all the money that you earned from your job, and then you had to turn around at the end of a quarter, three months, and give so much of it, send a check in to the government, boy, there'd be a lot of changes in tax laws, I can guarantee you. But most of us don't have to worry about um, paying taxes because it's taken out in advance. But that's uh, the second area. The third area I'm, I would suggest is savings. Uh, I know that many people say, I don't have enough money to save any money. Well, that's what I always said when I was growing up, but I found out that no matter how small an amount you put in savings, it always matters. And now I'm 60, I'll be 66 in a month or so, and, uh, and I have found that the accumulation of 50-something years of my financial life, that it has... Uh, uh, turned into something a little more significant than at first I thought it was going to be. So no matter how small it is, you need to put something up else for yourself. I use a rule, uh, and I've promoted a rule for knowing how to uh, divide and spend your finances. I call it the 80-10-10 rule. I put up all right, 80% I live off of, and 10% I put in savings, and 10% uh, goes for my tithe, and I live off the other 80%. And that seems to be a good but you have to, you know, you have to figure how much you can live off of. The third, the fourth thing are expenses. Uh, put the most important ones first. I know all of you guys understand this because you guys are great at living on your budgets and handling your finances, and you've lived this long, so you obviously are doing a good job. But there are a lot of people that don't know this, and I'm, I'm, I'm amazed, especially as our young people, uh, hopefully they can grab onto something like this. But you put the most expo expensive, uh, the most important expenses first, like your home. <laughs> the second would be your utilities. You gotta keep the power on, and you gotta keep the things going. Your automobile might be the third, because I don't know how people function nowadays without some type of, of transportation 
attention. And then food, luxuries go way down the list. Entertainment and, uh, and fashion and toys. You know, you'd be shocked at how many people through the years, because I've been on many, many uh, benevolence committees and, uh, uh, that handle people when they come in and request, hey, uh, I, I need the church to give me some money. Uh, I don't have enough to pay my bills or whatever it might be. And you'll be shocked at how many people, honestly, you look at and you said, well, um, uh, what kind of expenses do you have? And they have a cell phone bill that's $150. They have a cable bill that's $175. They have all kinds of entertainment expenses and they can't pay their power bill. It's like, do you not understand that it's more important to have food to eat than it is to have a cell phone or, or a new TV or a cable system somewhere? See, budgeting lets you see that you don't have enough resources for all of that and that the priorities, uh, you put the priorities at the top and then the rest comes later. You can't, don't spend all the money that you have. Don't spend down to nothing because if you spend down to nothing, <laughs> like, it's like driving your automobile till the motor quits and then, and then, and then you walk. But we need to budget, that way we can watch our finances like we watch a gas gauge and there are all kind of methods to do your budget. Justin, I think you did this one time. Did you put your, some of your stuff in socks at one time? Did you ever do that? Somebody did it in our church, seriously. I, I mentioned, I said, all right, there are all kinds of ways you can budget. You can put your money in envelopes, like uh, at the, when you get paid, put this much for house note, this much for utilities, this much for groceries, this much for our, our power bill and so forth, and just put a little bit of money in each envelope. And then every week, as it adds up, you, know, you put enough money to be able to pay those bills. Well, that's one way to do it. Socks you could use instead of envelopes. You can use... Uh, balance lines and a checkbook, you know, keep two or three different categories and so forth. But there are all kinds of ways to budget. But the law of the budget just helps you keep straight and keep the anxiety level down. Here's the third law of, of finances, the law of the fish. Now, I use the word the law of the fish because it's uh, hopefully a little catchy and it'll help you remember. The law of the fish just simply says that God will provide for my needs. This is what he's promised, that God will provide for my needs and all I need to do is open my eyes and see what God has provided. Now, the fish title comes from an incident that Jesus had with Simon Peter in which he and Simon Peter owed taxes to the Roman government. And here's what Jesus told Peter to do. This is Matthew 17, verse 27. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, this is Jesus talking. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you've opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. So, this is, the, the fish, the money was a resource that was available to Peter in order to take care of his necessity, but he just couldn't see it until Jesus exposed it to him. Abraham, I mean, the Bible's full of these kind of incidences. Abraham, when he took Isaac up on the mountain, and, and there was a ram caught in the thicket that became the sacrifice, well, the ram was only exposed when God exposed it so they could see that the ram would meet the need. The widow and the oil, when Elisha was at her house and she thought she was gonna die and had no more resources, and Elisha said, do you have any bowls? And she brought a bowl and he filled it up with oil and she brought all the bowls that she had. Uh, maybe went to the neighbor's house, got all the bowls, but she had plenty of oil uh, but she couldn't see it until God exposed it to her. Elijah, the prophet, went to the brook and sat by the brook and God says, all right, three times a day, I'm gonna send the ravens and the ravens are gonna bring you something to eat three times a day. So God provided for him. Elijah couldn't see that supply until God opened his eyes to be able to see it. 
When the disciples looked at 5,000 men, much less women and children on the hillside out there and said, Jesus, let's let these people go home because we don't have enough food to feed them. And Jesus says, well, what do we have? And they scrambled around out there and found five loaves and two little fishes that some boy had in a sack lunch. And they brought it back to Jesus and said, well, you know, we only have five loaves and two fishes and that's not gonna be enough to feed all of these people. And Jesus said, let me see it. And he blessed it and then he broke it and he gave it to them. And they not only had enough to feed all these people, they had 12 basketfuls left over. Remember, we're asking God to let us see what he has already provided for us and what hinders us from being able to see what God has already provided for us. Well, one big obstacle that we have in seeing this is wasting what he already has provided for us. Waste blocks our vision. Eliminate waste, and God will show us more. I use a couple of examples of this. Uh, Ask yourself the question, when you need more resources, all right, you're budgeting the resources you have. You're taking care of the resources you have. You're not wasting the resources that you have. You're not frivoling them away. You're using them productively and wisely and you've got a budget going and you need more resources. What can you do? Here's what you ask yourself. Well, what else can I do? I mean, I have a job. I'm doing everything I can with it. So I need more resources. So God, what else can I do? And I'm gonna use David as an example. Now this, ha- this event happened in David's life when he was young. And he had been anointed to be the king of Israel. And Saul had a problem. Saul uh, had this uh, uh, anxiety issue, or uh, they, called it a, uh, uh, they called it an evil spirit. Uh, but he had this problem, maybe depression or something like that. And when he would get into one of these deep depressions, he needed someone to play some wonderful, sweet music to get him out of that scene to help his depression. So his guys, his soldiers, and his counselors began to look around for somebody that could fulfill this need. And here's what one of the soldiers said. But what I want you to see is, I want you to see all of the things that David could do. When you have a need and you don't have the resources, God, what else can I do? And here's David. Uh, Then one of the servants answered and said, all right, we're looking for the guy. One of the servants said, look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Look at all these skills. Who is skillful in playing. All right, so he can play. That's one of the gifts he has. So he can use that gift. Maybe he could gain some resources with that gift. Also, he's a mighty man of valor, which means he's brave. He's a brave young man. Uh, a mighty man of war, which means he's a skilled soldier and he can fight real well. He's prudent in speech, which just means he's diplomatic. He knows how to talk to people. He knows what to say. He's not, he, 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 he's not foot in mouth kind of person. He's the kind of person that'll, that'll represent you well. And he's a handsome person, <laughs> you know, which is always an asset, right? I mean, look, hey, if God has given you an asset, use it. I mean, use everything that you have and it says, and the Lord is with him. So you have to work it all. Whatever resources God has given you to be able to be blessed with, you have to work it all. If he's made you smart, if he's made you productive, if you're mechanical, if you can build things, if you can do things, if you can fix things, uh, all of those are resources that you can, that God can use in you to bring more resources into your life. I mean, God can give you one idea that can change your whole life. Pray for an idea. God, give me an idea like Jacob did. You remember Jacob was working for Laban and Laban was stealing all of the sheep and all the resources. He worked for him for 20 years, 21 years. And man, all of a sudden now he's, uh, <laughs> he has nothing. 
And God says, all right, let me tell you what to do. When the sheep are at the, when the goats are at the, at the watering trough, I want you to take some sticks and I want you to just cut the bark off of some of them and make them striped. And then I want to make, some of them got little holes cut in them, make them spotted. And then some of them, and, and then we got the, uh, the speckle stuff. And when they're sitting there drinking in the watering trough, get down there and hold those sticks up in front of them like that so they can see the sticks. I'm sure Jacob said, what? What in the, look, I graduated from Mississippi State University. Now, I did not graduate with a degree in agriculture or, or uh, husbandry or anything like that. My degree was in education. But I was around a lot of people that did, were vets and other people like that. And I never, I've never heard one time that this kind of thing works in life. I've never heard anybody say, well, if you want to have some speckled sheep, speckled goats, get you some stick and cut the bark off of them and make it look speckled and then hold it up in front of them when they're drinking water and they'll start having speckled babies. No, this is an idea God gave to Jacob and said, you just did. I'm sure Jacob said, what in the world is that going to do? God said, you just do it. And he did. And all of the goats began to have striped goats, spotted goats, speckled goats, and all that. And Laban said, before all of that, Laban said, I'm going to give you all of the goats that are spotted, speckled, and all that striped. And he ended up having more, Jacob ended up with more uh, animals, more livestock than Laban did. And Laban said, buddy, you, you know, you got to go. Uh, what I'm saying to you in the law of the fish is, um, Ask yourself, what do I have near me? What do I have that's right around me that is at my disposal that could be a source for God's blessings in the financial area of my life? I'll give you an example of something that just was said to me the other, uh, a couple of days ago. And just as an example, um, and I'm not going to mention who it was, but you probably all can guess, uh, I said, what you doing? Uh, we're over here at a church uh, somewhere, uh, Diverville somewhere, getting some pews, church pews, old church pews. Uh, what, you, what are you going to do with, the, with church pews? Well, we're going to use them for a certain uh, reason, and then after that, I'm going to start cutting them up, and I'm going to make small little benches like people put on their front porch, and uh, we're going to sell them. And I thought to myself, that's genius. You know, I mean, how, how much would people pay for something like that? And how much, I mean, how could you, do, see, that's an idea. That, that's just a, a revelation of an idea that can bring in resources. Some of you have antiques up in your attic. You know, you've never even seen them in the last 30 years because you hadn't been up there to look at them. You drag those things down. You can sell them. In other words, your miracle could be right at your fingertips is what I'm saying. So the law of the fish says, what else can I do? All right, here's the, here's the fourth law, the law of contingency. Oh, that sounds exciting, right? The law of contingency. Okay, Proverbs 21, 20, look at what it says. There is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. Many people don't function well with this particular law. Because many people, if they get paid any extra, if they get any loosening in their financial strain, the first thing they do is they go down to Walmart and they buy everything that their beady little eyes see. It's almost as if you can't leave any money in your pocket. I'm telling you, look, I've had to work with my grandchildren a lot. And I'm telling you, they, they're used to spending money. Uh, they're not used to having to save, evidently. But I declare, man, I get on to them all the time. Son, you do not have to spend every dime that you make. It is not illegal to save some money. You do not have to spend everything. It's all right to put a little bit up for a rainy day. But I've had people say to me, certain contingency plans. You know that life insurance is a contingency plan, right? It, 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 it is, you buy something in advance so that in case something happens, then you're gonna have some resources provided to take care of those that you love. That, that's a life insurance contingency. Now, I'm not trying to sell life insurance, and I had it when I was young and had lots of expenses and a long time to live, probably. 
Now, as I've gotten older, uh, things have swapped and the money that I have is more equal to the amount of time I have left and blah, blah. Anyway, you know how all that works. But I have had people, that I want to just mention this to you. I have had people tell me when, I was, when I'd preach about something like this, especially when I was young, and I would have people tell me, well, pastor, we think that buying life insurance is, it distributes a lack of faith. And I would say, what are you talking about? They said, well, when I buy life insurance, I'm basically saying to God, I think I'm going to die. So in other words, I'm insulting the integrity of God to say, God, I don't think you can take care of me and I don't think you have a plan. So in case your plan doesn't work, I'm going to buy some insurance so my family can be taken care of. And I thought, what kind of idiotic thinking uh, is that? Because here's the truth. I know, here's what I said to him. I said, let me tell you the truth, all right? Now, no, don't get your feelings hurt, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You're going to die. Whether you think you're going to die or not, you're going to die. You don't even have to think you're going to die. You know you're going to die. Unless you are alive with that generation that's here when Jesus comes, you are going to die. What's the problem with preparing for that? Does that show a lack of faith? I had others say something like this. Well, I'm not going to buy any life insurance for my wife because I don't want my wife being chased around by a bunch of men when I die for her money. And here's what I said. Well, you do want her to have the choice, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you leaving her with five kids and no money, and she doesn't have any appreciable uh, uh, abilities to make enough money to support five kids and the house note and the utilities note and the car note and all that, and you leaving her with nothing, what do you think she's going to do to get resources? She's probably going to have to try to find a man somewhere that'll, that's willing to take on a whole ready-made family so she could even survive in this world, man. Don't, I mean, look, leave her a bunch of money. At least she'll be able to choose which one she wants. Contingency, see? I mean, do you think that distributes a lack of faith to put a little money in the bank? Is that lack of faith? To have a little, little savings account, a little retirement fund? You guys got retirement funds, right? Why do you have them? Contingency. What if I live way past the amount of time I can afford? I need some resources. Is that unspiritual? An emergency fund, a contingency fund. I had somebody say, yeah, pastor, that's just... The lack of faith. And I asked them, here's the question. Do you have a spare tire in your trunk? Why? Yes, you do. Why do you have one? Because you don't like to walk. And you know that there's a possibility that one of the tires on your automobile is going to go flat one day. And you're going to need a contingency plan to take care of the fact that you're flat can't be fixed immediately. Why don't, you, why don't you just believe God that you won't ever have a flat? <laughs> you know, if that's not gonna be a godly thing. Look, we can get so blind about some things, especially when it sounds spiritual. This is what the scripture actually teaches about contingency plans. Exactly the opposite. Let me just read it to you. Matthew 25, beginning at verse one. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels and their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. That's typical, right? People that don't plan want somebody to bail them out. Uh, give us some of your oil. We didn't plan. We were sorry. We were lazy. We didn't think we needed it. So you take care of us. Okay. But the wise answered saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. 
Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and he said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. I mean, here's what contingency thinking is. What am I going to do if what I think is going to happen is not what happens? Like Joseph in Egypt, Pharaoh had the dream. You remember seven fat cows followed by seven skinny cows that came up out of the Nile River and ate up the fat cows. And Joseph said, that means we're going to have seven good years, plentiful years. And then we're going to be followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh said, all right, I'm going to put you in charge you get the, during the good years, you store up the good stuff so that when we get to the seven years of bad stuff, we'll have enough, enough resources. And because of that, uh, all of Egypt was saved and all of Israel, by the way. I mean, the law of contingency is God's way of saying to us, uh, put some stuff up for a rainy day. Just like, you, just like your mom and your grandmama used to tell you, son, you need to put some stuff up for a rainy day. All right, law number five, the law of excellence. The law of excellence says you can save yourself a lot of money if you take care of what God has given you. Let me give you a couple of pointers I've learned through the years. Automobiles run better when you change the oil every now and then. Automobiles function better if you change a filter every now and then. Tires run better if they're properly inflated. Pay attention to them. Air conditioners. Air conditioners work better and longer if you change the filter every once in a while. When you open the filter door and there are stalactites on the filter, it means that your air conditioner's not going to last very much longer. Leaky pipes do not heal themselves. They cost you a lot more money if you wait until they blow up before you fix them. Excellence transcends into every area of your life. Let me, here's the testimony of an excellent person. This is Dan, the book of Daniel, chapter six. Listen, this is what was said about him. Then this Daniel that really sounds like an accusation. <laughs> then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Listen to this. But they could not find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Excellence in finances means take care of your stuff. Clean your stuff up. Organize your stuff. Be able to find your stuff. I mean, make sure your stuff's not covered up with all the other junk. God might call it to your mind as, as a way to meet some need in your life, but you can't find it if it's all covered up. Remember, waste hinders our ability to see. Quit asking God to give you more when you don't take care of what he's already given you. The law of excellence. Number six, the law of the seed. Now, this is probably the most often uh, uh, the law that's most, effin, uh, most often stretched beyond imagination. This, this law is probably prostituted more than any of, other, of God's other spiritual laws. People take this thing and they just do all kinds of gymnastics to it. But here's what the law of the seed simply says. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and then I'm gonna read uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, but, but I wanna read that first, this one first. Verse six, 2 Corinthians nine, but, I say, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The law of the seed says, the seed you sow produces a harvest. So if what God has for you in, in your life 
does not require God to provide bountifully for you, then you sow a little bit of seed. But if your life that God has called you to is going to require God to do miraculous things in the financial area or resource area of your life, then you might consider uh, sowing bountifully into your future. Now, we need to understand this, and this is vitally important. You cannot sow a seed until you first tithe. If you're, if you're, giving, if you're not tithing, whatever amount of money you're giving and you say, man, this is gonna be my seed, God. I'm planting my seed. No, you're not because you didn't tithe. So you're cursed. And I'm gonna show it to you. Let me just read it to you. This is Malachi chapter three, verses nine and 10. And here's what, here's what it says. You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. What is God saying to Israel right there? You are cursed because you are stealing my money. So what's the solution to the dilemma? The very next verse. Let me read it, lead into it. You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So the dilemma is Israel is cursed because they're stealing from God. The God's solution is bring all the tithes into the storehouse and I'll remove the curse. Now, the tithe has been taught from the very beginning. Abraham tithed to the prince of Salem, which was Melchizedek, as an, as an illustration of our giving spiritually to someone who represents God. That's who Melchizedek represents. And then Jacob, Jacob, when he saw the angels going up and down the ladder at Bethel, and, he, and, it, and it impressed him so much. Do you know that the next morning, Jacob looked at God and said, God, I'm going to give you 10% of everything that you put in my hands from this point forward. I mean, and there wasn't even a campaign going. It impressed him so much. So I'm just saying that the tithe has always been the standard for our responsibility to give to God. And the tithe is simply obedience. It is not extraordinary to tithe. It is not above and beyond measure for to tithe. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And when you do, it removes the curse for the charge of stealing from God. What your seed is, is an investment into your dream, into where you believe God is going to take you. So we looked at verse six where it said, so sparingly, reap sparingly, so bountifully, reap bountifully. Next verse, verse seven, 1 Corinthians nine. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That just simply says, don't give because you're being pressured to give. And don't give because somebody's trying to sell you something in big, some big campaign somewhere. Give because you love God and you're happy about it, cheerfully. And God, verse, next verse, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. What does all grace mean? It means all the graces, spiritual grace, uh, emotional grace, mental grace, physical grace, uh, all grace abound toward you so that you always having all sufficiency in all things, not just spiritual things, 
but in everything in your life, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, listen to this, now may he who supplies seed to the sower, <laughs> where, where do we get our seed? He gives it to us. I mean, we're sowing his seed that he has given to us, and he has. He's given us the ability to have seed, to think, to work, to have physicality, to have skills and, and do those things. Yeah, so he's given us the seed in order to sow. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. You determine your harvest by how you sow. And you can only sow after you've been obedient to tithe. It's not magic. It's not, this is not a circus trick. It's not magic. It is a principle of God about sowing and reaping. All right, verse, uh, law number seven, the law of credit. The law of credit. Uh, some people teach that you should never use credit. Now, I'm going to not be that, I'm obviously not that narrow about it. I think there are some things that we probably have to use credit for. Houses are big purchases. Automobiles nowadays are big purchases. Uh, there are lots of things in our life where credit can be used effectively. And I don't think there's any spiritual uh, you know, law against using credit. I just want to give you a couple of things that the Scripture says about it if, if, if we're going to do it. And I have done it, and I continue to do it, and I've used it successfully and effectively, and I'm sure you have too. So this is not a prohibition against credit. I just want you to see what God says about it. 2 Kings 6, 5. All right. Um, this verse offers an area of concern if you're gonna borrow something. Because this verse is about a young student in the school of prophets where Elisha the prophet had a school of prophets and they were building something and they had to chop down trees to build it. And one of the young students borrowed an ax head. And here's what it says, 2 Kings 6, 5. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water and he cried out and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. Well, you might wonder why he got so upset that he lost this borrowed axe head. Well, here's the law in Exodus 22 about that. And if a man borrows anything from his neighbor and it becomes injured or dies, the owner of it not being with it, he shall surely make it good. So the law of Exodus was, if you borrow something and you break it or you damage it, then you have to replace it. So borrowing can easily become a double whammy in life. In other words, in borrowing, you can lose what you borrowed break what you borrowed, and then have the responsibility of buying the owner of it a new whatever to replace it. And now you don't have the one that was broken because it doesn't work anymore, and you have bought a new one for somebody else, and you don't have that either. Have you ever had to do this, by the way? Have you ever had to uh, supply something that you broke or that you lost or whatever by someone and you said, you know, hey, I lost it or I broke it and now you gotta do it. I mean, have you ever, if you've ever had this happen to you, you learn very quickly, you know what I need to do? I need to either buy this thing myself or I need to rent it. And, and that way, if, I, if something happens to it, then I don't have to buy somebody else a new one and I'm still out the money and I still don't have the product. I mean, never borrow anything that you're not willing to purchase or to replace if something happens to it. Now, let me talk to you about co-signing real quick. And I know I, I hear you breathe hard, but let me say this. I know that many parents have to help their children get started in life. And I know many times the way you do it as a parent is by co-signing something with them so that they can get credit established and so forth on something that's usually larger and, and will give them the ability to do that. So 
that's a, that's a unique thing. And, uh, you know, that, I mean, you, that's you. And, and I know that you love your children and you probably trust them and you're going to do it. And that's okay. Uh, just be prepared to pay for it. But other than that, <laughs> other than that. And uh, all right, so what, why not cosign? Because I'm going to tell you, the scripture tells you don't do it. Why not cosign? Well, it's the same kind of thing uh, that with, uh, with borrowing something. Look, the reason people need a cosigner, you know why they need a cosigner? Because the bank doesn't think they're going to pay it back. And there's a good reason for that, because most of the time they don't. The statistics are that 50% of the money that is loaned by banks to people with cosigners, the cosigner ends up having to pay it back. With other financial institutions like loan companies and so forth, the percentage is 75% is paid back by the cosigner. So here's what the scripture says in Proverbs 22. Now I know if it's your child, you're gonna do it anyway, so don't get mad at me, all right? Um, Proverbs 22, verse 26. Do not be one of those who shakes hands in a pledge, one of those who is a guarantee for debts, if you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take away your bed from under you? So this is just saying, look, if you co-sign for somebody, they're gonna live high, wide, and handsome, and the bank's gonna come get your bed. They're gonna repossess your house or whatever it is they have to do. So don't co-sign unless you're willing to pay the note for them. Your, relation, if, if, your relationship with them will change when they miss a note. When the bank calls you and says, hey, your buddy that you co-signed with is not paying for that automobile and you're watching him drive down the road with the top down and a coontail hat on, cheering and enjoying and all of that, and you're thinking, sucker, get down there and pay the car note. They fixed it to come repossess my house. It's going to change your relationship. Or when you hear that they're down in Cancun because they got a great deal on a hotel room or something, you know, it's going to change your relationship with them. And credit cards, average debt's 5000 on each card. We all have credit cards. You just use them wisely. You come out of debt one step at a time, uh, pay the most expensive ones, get all of that strategy, and stay away from easy credit. Oh, by the way, I want to tell you this, and I know you, you guys are are aware of this, I'm sure, but maybe some of these people online aren't. Stay away from easy credit. One of the biggest deals, and I would say scams, but they, it, the rules are out there. Most people just don't read them. Um, so they're not really doing anything illegal. They're just taking advantage of your inability to pay attention. But uh, one, one of the easiest things is this 12 months same as cash. That's the easy credit. Of course, they're charging you about 29% credit 29% uh, uh, liability charge or interest charge if you don't pay it. You have, you, know, you pay it, but let me just tell you this. If you don't pay all of that loan, every dime of it before 12 months is up, you're gonna get charged every bit of interest from the very start of it until the very end. You can owe five cents at the, at the end of 12 months and you're going to have to pay every bit of interest from the very beginning of the loan for the whole amount of the loan all the way to the very end. So just be careful about stuff like that. That's just a, an advantage. Law number eight, real quick, the law of work. This is one of my favorite laws because I really believe in this so deeply. I was taught by my dad, if you're not uh, bleeding or have fever, um, you be at work. And I, I show up at work. Second Thessalonians 3.10, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Verse 11, for we hear, listen to this, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner not working at all, but are busybodies. Paul's saying there's a bunch of gossips in your church that aren't working and they're just running around stirring up trouble in the church. He goes on to say, verse 12, now, now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And he adds to that, 1 Thessalonians 4, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, 
to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we have commanded with you. Work is a responsibility that God's given us to provide for our needs in life. And it also um, is important for a sense of self-worth. It gives you a sense of, of fulfillment. Uh, people pray for resources and finances and provisions, and they even rebuke the thief you know, in their life. So let me tell you the tool the Holy Spirit uses so often to answer the prayer for resources and finances and provisions and so forth in life. Spell it with me, J-O-B. Get a job. That's the resource God has provided. You ladies, when you're looking for a soulmate, maybe I may not say this. First question you ask them is, do you go to church? Second question is, where do you work? If they stutter on either one of those, pfft, wave goodbye. That's, that's red flag. You might want to add another couple of questions. How long have you been there and how often do you miss? Uh, anyway. All right, here we go. Um, let me give these others because it's time to quit. Verse nine, the law of ethics. The law of ethics, ethics are your guiding principles. The principles that guide you are your ethics. First Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12. Uh, we read verse 11 a moment ago. I'm gonna add verse 12. Here's verse 11. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. The next verse. That you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. This is just saying, if you aspire to lead a quiet life and you mind your own business and you work with your hands like God has designed you to do, then you're gonna have a good testimony to those on the outside. On the outside of what? On the outside of the kingdom of God. That you're gonna have a good testimony to people that see you as to what kind of character a person who loves God has not some lazy bum walking around with other, wanting other people to support them, but work hard and, do, and, and have a good testimony. Pay your bills. Don't take advantage of others. Don't try to be slick and dishonest. If you do, don't tell them you're a Christian um, because it's an insult <laughs> to the kingdom. I, I wrote in, in, uh, in the notes uh, some examples of ethics and vows, and I, I would read them, but we're really running short, very short on time. Um, but they're there in the notes. If you want to pick up the notes, I've given you a couple examples of ethics in honesty and ethics in investments, and I, it might do you good to read those. All right, verse 10, I mean, excuse me, law number 10, the law of the cross. The law of the cross says, bring your finances to the cross. Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 17, you'll recognize this story. Now, as they were going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that's God. You know the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, one thing you lack Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now I want you to hear what Jesus said next to the disciples. This is the next verse. Here's what Jesus said. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is identifying the fact that the more riches you have, the more difficult it is for you to, to be serious about the kingdom of God and to be a part of the kingdom of God. Maybe it's because of what Paul later identifies to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. Here's what he said. The love of money, this is what Paul's saying to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So money's not the root of evil, the love of it is, right? So it's not bad to have money, uh, but to love it more than anything is a problem. It creates uh, uh, derails and entraps. And, and the rest of that verse says, and some people, 
craving money, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So the cross is the place of total loss. Jesus lost everything on the cross. The only earthly possession he had was that robe that he had, and they gambled for it at the foot of the cross. So Jesus lost everything at the cross. The cross is a place of death. And so financially, if we, Jesus taught us that we can't have too much important on the possessions of life. Because if we place too much importance on the possessions of life, they're gonna hinder us and entrap us and entangle us so that we don't serve the kingdom like we should. So the 10th law is, hey, bring your resources to the cross and sacrifice them there. The Lord can make any kind of demands he wants to about our, about our possessions. He bought us. He is our Lord. He's our master, and he has the right to make any kind of demands that he wants on our finances. All right, there they are, the laws of your finances. All right, hope you did well on that. I know you all did because y'all got capable and wonderful people and love the Lord, so all right. But you can tell everybody else what I said, all right? All right, bow your head, bow your head.